You can stay on the agenda. Go for it. All right. Welcome, everyone. This is the weekly TSC call. Um, this is a public call. Anybody is welcome to join, listen in, and contribute. There are two requirements, being uh, ready to live by the antitrust policy and the code of conduct, all of which I suspect everybody knows by now. So um, we have quite a bit to discuss that I put on the agenda. I wanted hey, to ask- can you uh, refresh? The, yeah. I've got one for the election there that should be in there. I had it just a minute ago, so refresh. Sorry, Arno. Apologize. I already have an agenda item for this. Uh, this. Is there more? No, no, there it is. Sorry, I didn't see it. Uh, it's okay. You can. I, I think we should wait a bit. Let, let's get uh, through the quarterly reports first. So there were two quarterly reports that were submitted one for Cactus, one for Caliper. I didn't see anything requiring specific discussion by the TSC, but as always, please let me know if anybody has any questions or comments, or if one of the project uh, representatives want to highlight anything specific for the TSC beyond what's in the report already. Okay, if not, Let's keep on going. Uh, I do want to highlight the Avalon report is due. So please, if you're part of this project, make sure it happens. Otherwise, we're actually doing pretty well in terms of where we are. And this is the start of October. So we are getting into the Q4 reports. But so we're, except for Avalon lagging a bit, we have got all the Q3 reports. So we're in pretty good shape. And just to chase after people, it looks like the uh, the cactus uh, um, report was only seen by about half of the uh, TSC, yes. and uh, likewise uh, uh, with uh, Caliper. So uh, just a, a nudge to TSC members to to try to try to review those. I think it's important that we get the majority, if not all, the the, the check marks in there uh, each week. Yeah, and and as a matter of fact, I've noticed that having this call. And leaking to the report seemed to be a good trigger for this to happen. And so when there is no call, we skip a week, things don't seem to be done or reviewed the same way. So if anything, having a, you know, at least semi-regular call seems to be helpful in getting things, things done. So TSC election, Dave, what's going on? There's been a bit of hiccups. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to try to keep this brief. Um, we had to restart the election this weekend because we had um, some issues with naming of one of the candidates. And so some of you may have received um, two ballots. Just disregard the first one, cast your ballot in the second one. Um, this does not allow people to vote twice. The first one is dead, dead. You won't be able to use it. If you already did cast your vote, you need to cast it again using the second ballot. If you had cast it before Monday at 1030 a.m. Pacific. Correct. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. So that's really what's been going on. We've, um, other than that, we had a really clean voter rolls and we've been able to get emails out to pretty much everybody. Um, we have uh 88 out of almost 300 or sorry almost 800 people vote so make sure you get your uh your votes cast before too long we're going to go through the 10th of october like midnight on the 10th of october pacific time is when i'm going to shut it down so hey there's the a lot of there's a lot of emails coming into elections that people haven't gotten their ballots um i sent one uh right after i cast my vote uh, for somebody yep. in the Accenture team. Uh, what's going on with those? Um, I'll be going through those today and onesie twosies trying to get everybody to make sure they have a ballot. Um, and yeah, so we'll, I'm just going to address them as they come in. Uh, yesterday we got hung up on, on dealing with some other things, but yeah, it's first the top of my um, list for this morning to go through all of these. Okay. I mean, I've set, I sent mine on Monday, so, and I yep. haven't heard anything back. 
we were dealing with the restarting of the ballot and um, yeah, we were doing other things. I will be responding this morning. If for folks who don't know, there's an elections uh, email list of which uh, we are on and a few of the other um, uh, folks, TSC members, I believe, um, I, I, who, kind of handling these these deliverability issues where sometimes, you know, even though we put it into the system, the mail isn't able to get to the, the voter themselves. So uh, uh, we have a, a second path through Salesforce Marketing Cloud uh, where that we've used to reach all the voters to make sure that you know, presuming that has different deliverability issues, perhaps better deliverability um, to, to look out for a ballot if they don't have one to let us know through that elections list. So um, there's there's a process here and uh, uh, I just want folk, folks to know that there's also this transparency to this uh, additional group of <clears throat> folks on the elections list. Yeah, so as Tracy was saying, there are quite a few people reporting not having received the email. And I think there an email needs to be sent to all the voters telling them about these two ballots, because I know Rai sent an email to the TSC list. It says part two, which quite, and I don't blame you, Rai, but you know, it wasn't quite explicit what that meant, is that uh, you know, it, people need to be told, if you have cast the first ballot, you know, of, of vote with the first ballot, forget it, this is gone. And so you need to cast again your vote with the second ballot. And so because we're going to miss people otherwise. I know there's roughly a dozen people who have reported not receiving a ballot, not many, many, many. And uh, we did send an email out using Marketing Cloud uh, yesterday evening. Um, maybe it had gone out this morning. I need to double check with, with Jessica, but um, the CA team, we crafted an email explaining what happened. Uh, I talked to Jessica last night at about 8 p.m. Pacific time to get it queued up. Um, I'm not sure if it has gone out yet or like, you know, uh, it might've okay. gone out last night, but I know it's being queued and I know it's going out, so. Okay, I've not received it yet. So I didn't know if it was done or not. And, and, um, and the, I, I wonder how useful that is. I mean, it'll be useful. You'll probably see a lot more than 12 people reporting that they haven't gotten their ballots. Um, but it doesn't help them cast their vote, right? If they don't have the ballot, there's no way to cast yeah, their yeah, vote. Yeah, of course. That, that's a different problem. I agree with you, Tracy. But we also need to tell people what's going on, um, that there is this restart. I don't think the restart was communicated quite well. Yeah. But the other thing is uh, there is uh, Maria uh, Teresa Nieto said that her name was misspelled. Was that fixed? So no, that one wasn't fixed. So I copied and pasted these from the um, nomination statements. And so if it was misspelled on the wiki, it's misspelled on the ballot. Um, I have updated the procedure for next year so that the week we spend confirming everything, part of the process will be confirming names on the ballot. So <clears throat> the Arun one, that one was my fault um, because I had uh, misnamed his his uh, nomination thing. And so that was corrected on the wiki, but there was like just a timing issue and we can't keep restarting this vote. I'm sorry. So well, I agree, but you know, I for one voted with the first uh, ballot just before you sent the second one. And then I saw Maria's email. I was like, oh, they are going to restart again. I'm holding off until I know for sure I don't have to go through this voting process again and again. So I think you should respond to Maya. Maybe you have, not on the list. I didn't see any response to let her know, you know, we apologize, but at this point we'll have to keep it the way it is. Yeah, it's top of my list to go through and respond to all the emails in the election mailing list this morning. So as soon as we get off this call, I'll be going through each of those and addressing them. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, yeah, time? what was the address from which the email was sent? Because I can't find mine either. Although I did get email from Rye, but I think that was to the TSC. Um, uh, the email comes from, <clears throat> just hold on a moment. It comes from so, civs mm -hmm. at cs.cornell.edu. C-I-V-S, so Charlie Indigo Victor Sierra at cs.cornell.edu. And at what email do you expect it to come to, Chris? My work email. Okay, well, let me double check that that's what we have for the, your voter rolls. 
for our voter rolls. Pretty sure Tracy. I don't, I don't think they have an email that says Chris works. <laughs> Can you be more explicit? <laughs> <laughs> Master Sing 24. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. All right, guys, Chris, let's not spend too much time on the specific case. Sorry, Chris. I Chris, I'm going to ping you directly on ch on uh, chat.hyperledge.org with the email address that I have for you, okay? Is that going to work? Uh, that would be fine, but again, I didn't get an email, is what I'm saying. I've checked all yeah. my emails. Well, maybe we have the wrong email for you. Yeah. I mean, maybe he's not eligible to vote. I am. I checked. He totally is. He's in there. <laughs> I know. I didn't see it. I've him a hard time. All right. I have had enough of this discussion, guys. I, clearly, it's not been perfect. We'll have to make it to keep improving. For, but uh, let's make sure everybody gets to vote at least. All right, thank you for your efforts, Dave. Uh, let's keep moving. Um, yeah, borough. So there was a brief discussion on this last on the last call. I wanted to, you know, just give everybody a chance to speak up if they wanted to. Um, I mean, um, Silas was pretty, you know, candid in his report, saying that you know they are busy with other things in Monax and they don't expect much activity, if at all, in the next several months. And so he was candidly asking, you know, well, I don't know what you want us to do with this project, but I've heard, you know, the people, people who have spoken up so far have all said, hey, we use at least the borough EVM in our project. You know, this is an important piece for us. We want to keep borough. And so my assumption is, we have acknowledged Silas, uh, uh, you know, notification that there's not going to be much activity for the next uh, quarter, but we are okay with this and uh, we are not going to take any other action, you know, with regard to borrow. Does anybody want, is everybody cool with this or does anybody want to say anything else? I, I guess as someone who's not <coughs> um, involved in the EVM process, my only question would be, are there folks that are paying attention to any vulnerabilities or fixing bugs if there are any? Um, hi, this is Silas. Uh, well, there's certainly us. Um, there you are. There's all... <laughs> hi. Welcome. Um, <laughs> uh, th Sorry, there's also... Ah, uh, yes, no, um, no, it's been a little while. Um, I had to find the Zoom passcode. Um, there is a there is another company that has been building on top of burrow that i haven't caught up with recently but i know that one of our other maintainers caught wind um uh, of them mentioning burrow um so i think uh, the name of the company is escaping me i put it on a previous report um so so there's us there's them um but yeah there's there's not there's not an incredibly high amount of um usage flux i guess to, to be finding um issues um but i mean it's not particularly worse than 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 before um, there's also the other piece of work that I could have mentioned that uh, Sean mentioned is that he's been working uh, with Solang and, and getting up the WASM support so solidity to WASM is in there uh, yeah I mean my I mean I you haven't seen responses I think maybe I was slightly I wasn't trying to be doom and gloom I, I've got no desire to wrap burrow up um, but I also don't in the, in the near term have an ability to, to sort of guarantee that, that work will be happening on it. Uh, it's essential for, for, for Monax. There's, there's more stuff to do. Um, but yeah, it has always been kind of, oh, we just need, uh, you know, a few extra people to be interested and we'll have all this stuff, uh, done. And, and that's kind of jam tomorrow argument. Um, so I just wanted to, to be clear what the, the next little while was looking. So, but, you know, if, if there's no urgent need to, to kind of um, worry about, you know, sunsetting burrow, then I, I think that I would expect to see a pickup in activity, certainly from us, hopefully from others next year. Okay. Well, again, thank you for, you know, the transparency here. 
But uh, back to Nathan's question, do you have an answer if there is like a critical problem, severity, like security issue, would you guys be able to address it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not like a, a zero time available. Um, it would have to go okay. through the, the GitHub issues. Um, you know, it's still, it's still like monitored. We're still, still making fixes. We're just not doing a lot of feature work. Okay, thank you. I saw Brian has his hands up. Yeah, I, I don't want to take any time from the other TSC members who want to comment on this, but um, if in my mind, there's, 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 you know, uh, the, eventually, I think this is better addressed on your proposal um, around uh, project maturity. Uh, but for me, a, a project like this, there's, there's three things to think about. I think the most important thing is just as Silas confirmed, if a security hole was noticed that there's um, time and resources and attention enough to be able to at least address that. Uh, and and push out an update and you know work with the security team on you know coordinating a cert uh, notice if that's required that sort of thing. Uh, I'd say the second most minimal thing would be if other developers did show up uh, that there's just enough attention paid to be able to help them bootstrap into solving the problem themselves and then uh, helping them be a part of uh, contributing into the code base right. Um, uh, perhaps nurturing new ma uh, maintainers uh, in the course of that, but but at least you know uh, not a, not a, a closed door to fixing of bugs uh, or, or those sorts of things. If that other help materializes, um, and then the third kind of thing is just uh, you know supporting newbie users. Uh, you know people who have kind of beginner questions. Um, there's not a lot of those that I see in the borough community, um, uh, but uh, I, I, that seems to be a small trickle still. And I think that's that's an essential part of helping grow new. Contributors, um, uh, but those those in my mind would be the three ranked kind of th m things that that if those weren't there, um, then it's time to talk about you know a path similar to say composer um, or or back into labs or something. But I feel like those are all here. I'm hearing that in Silas's uh, words. So I think and, and even the prospect beyond that of of some new work. But um, yeah, that's I just thought that might be helpful. All right, thank you. Any other comments from anyone? Yeah, I, I, I mean, my main concerns would be the security issues that we just discussed, you know, if something comes up. But also, um, you know, if you're on the main Hyperledger page, all the, all the projects are sort of up there with equal footing. Um, and I know it wouldn't help Burroughs Health per se, but, you know, do we want to somehow discourage people from starting to use it? Um, if it doesn't have things dedicated to it. I mean, I'd love for people to join the community, but also people come in and just use the code without contributing back. So, you know, that'd be my concern is if someone comes in and tries it and they're not getting support that they need, then it gives Hyperledger a bad name in general, not just the so is, is that much different than Brian's third point? I, right, or which what well, I forgot I forget which one of Brian's. I think it was the last one, right? About helping bootstrap in the community if people were in there, right? And you know, making sure that there's not a that there's not silence, you know, or or crickets, you know, if somebody does actually have questions about about borough, right? I mean, that's what I would agree. I agree with that point, and I think if if there were people who were contributing stuff, and I I didn't get the thing from from Silas's email or note that it wasn't it's just like, hey, we're not adding new features. Uh, clearly, I think if there are bugs in there, and I, I guess the other one would be if people did want to contribute and we're making fixes, right, that you don't end up with a backlog of like, you know, 70 pull requests, right? And I, again, I, don't, I didn't get that feeling that that's what <laughs> Silas was, was meaning in his note. So I guess, Mark, I guess, do you see a difference between it being out there and, 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 and Brian's so. point of addressing, ad addressing it when, 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 when people, if, if somebody complained that there was no attention given to it? I, I think my so, was intended more, you know, there's nothing, if, if someone's coming in new to Hyperledger, there's nothing right now that indicates the health of, you know, and this gets into the other conversation about the health of the project yes. that, you know, would steer people, you know, towards one project or another based on the community health. Um, so it, I, I agree with you on that, Mark, and I think we should defer that part because you know, I have on the agenda discussion of maturity level, and I think it touches on this. 
you know, at the member summit, we heard several people talk about the confusion about the greenhouse. You know, it's very hard for people to know what's going on. And so clearly we have an at least to do, you know, uh, uh, to do list to, to figure out how to better communicate what's going on in the project so that people who have no background come in there. I wouldn't want to discourage people from embarking in using Burrow, but I would want them to know, you know, what's going on so they have the right set of expectations. What you don't want to know to, to have is people come in and they think this is a full on project with a lot of people supporting it and they find themselves alone. That's bad. But uh, we have to somehow manage to focus, you know, to, to communicate this kind of stuff. Tracy is on. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a, a question. Like, I know Burrow is used uh, as the EVM engine for SAP, for Sawtooth, and for uh, the EVM chain code. What, what does this mean for, for those sorts of integrations? Um, you know, as, as kind of this, this slow period happens, um, I guess that's my, my question. Nothing changes. So, well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, well, like Tracy on the fabric EVM chain code, right, as part of, as part of that project, right, that, wow, we have a separate issue outside of what Silas was mentioning, potentially, but, you know, as part of that, right, there were actually people related to fabric who actually are, I believe they're actually also maintainers now as well, uh, Silas, if, I'm, if, I, if I remember correctly, but right, who, before we even embarked on that, on the fabric side, right, and putting it under fabric EVM chain code under the fabric moniker, we wanted to make sure that we had some people who were able to contribute and maintain that code. Now we have a different issue as to whether those people can still contribute and maintain that code, but that's outside of Silas's uh, purview. Yeah. So I mean, so the other thing is, I, I don't, I don't think it changes a huge much, a huge amount on the EVM code, which has been stable for a while. Um, and there certainly are fabric people who, who are proficient in that. Um, I think Swetha's on the call. Um, she's worked in that code. Um, so that's not really uh, uh, I, I, the relative amount of effort on that was really mostly maintenance. I think there are some um, some EIP, some Ethereum improvement program changes that um, are yet to make it in. So I guess um, uh, that that is something that that could do with happening. But the 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 feature work was always elsewhere, really, with Burrow. So so the EVM remains fairly stable, and and I think there's a few people who can get in there and fix issues. Um, yeah, the, the EVM, you know, we explicitly treat that as a, uh, a slower changing, uh, more stable part of our API because of the integrations with Seth and, and uh, Fabric EVM chain code. All right, anything else? I would think we have said about everything that could be said, but so again, I mean, you know, back to my statement earlier, I, what that means still is that for now, it's not like we're going to take any actions uh, against Borough, or, you know, I don't mean that in a negative way, uh, just, you know, we're leaving it alone. We have acknowledged that, you know, we can't expect much activity for the next quarter and that's okay. All right, so then there are two issues. The first one, I wanted to see where we stand it's this issue of, you know, rollover of projects tied to a single other project. So we discussed it a few times. I tried to assess whether there was interest for this. You know, when I asked, we literally had a vote on this, whether we should investigate, you know, developing a proposal for this. Only Dan and uh, Chris were against it. Some people were in support. A lot of people were like, well, I'm not sure. So we decided to move forward with it. And uh, after that, there was a lot of discussion uh, on the mailing list. Um, Transact was targeted, which was never my intent. <laughs> you know, I didn't think, was, you know, Transact should be singled out. Turns out that Transact had other users, even outside Hyperledger. So it wouldn't even be candidate for this policy if we had one. But I want to know whether there's still appetite to work on this or we should just shelve it and that's it. When, you know, we, we can decide to shelve it now, leave it now, and there's a new TSC that's going to come. They can decide whether they want to carry on with this or shelve it themselves. 
you know, it's up to us. But I would figure, you know, as part of the end of this term of the TSC, it'd be nice to clean the plate and see where we stand, at least on the issues we have. So, what do people think? This is Nathan. Um, I still like this policy because it doesn't tell us anything about what the answer would be, um, but it gives us a trigger as the TSC to ask the question. Um, and the hope is that that helps the projects um, recruit and uh, support more than one platform if that is their original intent. Um, and if you know that's not working out, we can help them find the place that will, will help them work better and work faster. Um, I, I don't think there's any project that would that would say I don't want to be rolled into another project where we would forcefully roll them into the other project. It's really just a, uh, a way for us to say, um, is the intent being met? And if it's not being met, would we be better off in a different place? And then we have that conversation and move accordingly. All right, so we have at yeah, least one I, vote I, we're continuing to work on this. Anyone else? Not I'm going to say what Nathan said. Man, that was well put, Nathan. I, I agree with everything you said. <laughs> okay. Who else? Chris. Um, I also agree with what everything Nathan said. I, I think this is the right thing. Just It's a nudge, right? You guys should talk. We don't predis, you know, predetermine the out, outcome. Um, and we should respect their decision. Okay. Anyone else want to speak? I don't, know if we need a separate, I don't know if we need a separate policy for this, or if it's just the should be the general policy that at every milestone period for a project that we uh, that that there's some assessment of the charter for that project because it could be that the scope of the project in some other dimension is not being addressed, or they're they're addressing some new scope that that should be acknowledged. Hmm. Interesting thought, Ben. Could you tease that out a little bit, Dan? Are you saying like every so often there's a gate or something? Yeah, so right now the main gates are just the, the um, incubation to active, uh, and those kind of things, which we don't have many of. Um, Otherwise, we've got the, the quarterly reports is the time to do some other lightweight assessment of whether a project is addressing its scope or its charter. Sure. So okay. you're, you're proposing adding like additional gates or, or just making it more explicit that uh, if your scope has changed, we need to reassess the project as a whole? Yeah, so I think uh, within the review from going from incubation to active, at one point at least we had some text in there about is the project substantially fulfilling its charter or its scope. I think that text is still in there. I'd have to go look. And so it seems like this would fall under that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, Dan's point is we could, you know, instead of being, you know, uh, focusing primarily on this notion that, you know, some project, uh, I've set the expectation or the goal to, to support or to be platform neutral, we could look at it more broadly, you know, maybe we should look at the charter and say, hey, is there anything where they are at odd with the initial charter? And that would be one possible thing that could be looked at in that context, but it doesn't have to be limited to that. Okay, Angelo. Yeah, no, I was thinking before, like, what happens if this, pro uh, first of all, let me tell you that I agreed last time, so I, I still agree with this policy, but uh, I was thinking now, what happens if this project for some reason is not used inside hyper inside a hyperledger but is very very used outside i mean it, to me it would be it's still at that point say okay if you are so used outside uh, maybe there's an issue with the project in hyperledger but second maybe you still deserve to be part of the, the ecosystem 
Uh, I know, but I absolutely, I believe there is some wording in that proposal that addresses that very case. Uh, I don't know where it I is. Think, but, I, but, 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 but I think you actually say are effectively tied to a single other project, right? I think that that maybe no, I'm talking, that, I'm talking inside, about what happened outside. Inside, 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 see, inside but see, Angelo, the, the last sentence of the first paragraph says, being tied to a single other project within Hyperledger and beyond. Mm. That's what's meant, you know, outside of Hyperledger. So, uh, and beyond. Okay, so maybe I missed that. Okay, cool. Well, maybe it should be better phrased. I don't know. But that was my idea was like, you know, I agree with you that if there's a project that doesn't have any other users than other projects outside of Hyperledger, but it's very popular outside of Hyperledger, we don't want to kill it for sure. And kill Perfect, it. then I'm fine. And, uh, and in fact, we wouldn't be able to roll it or into another project. There's nothing to roll it in anyway. So I, I think that's, you know, this was really more the example of a project, you know, I'll, I'll take Explorer for better and for worse, you know, it's like Explorer and this supports fabric. And then at some point you say, you know what, it's really a piece of fabric and maybe we should fold it into, into fabric. You know, it's this kind of situation. So we don't have to, I, I don't mean for us to, you know, uh, ash out all the details here, but what I'm hearing is there is still enough interest to keep this alive. Nobody has spoken in favor of just killing it now, saying, no, forget this. Did I miss that? I, I, I'm in favor of keeping it alive. I just didn't know if we should roll it over into any other discussions. It, it may be useful to consider in the context of the next uh, point of, of the, the project health uh, and yes. uh, point. This is also why I had tabled it off before and not even put it back on the agenda. So maybe it's good enough for now. Thank you for your input, guys. I, I, I'm, I'm satisfied with where we stand. We, we will keep it on the, on the backlog. We can look at it again. And, you know, with the, the, with the latest input we just got, including Dan's idea of maybe, maybe making it broader. But so let's move to the last agenda item I have for today, which is this, you know, notion of project maturity matrix. And again, this came up as part of the Hyperledger member summit. There were a lot of, you know, for those who weren't there, they, the, the member summit this year was organized really around like, you know, I would say uh, round tables with a lot of dialogue discussions. And there was not much presentation other than I think Brian's. <laughs> but, uh, and so it really helped having a lot of discussion about the status of Hyperledger, what goes well, what doesn't go so well, and what should we do? And, you know, there was a specifically discussions around the greenhouse and uh, we got a, quite a bit of feedback, uh, which was quite interesting. And um, there was a clear signal that people, like, as I was saying earlier, you know, are confused about the greenhouse, the different projects and how, you know, they compare to one another, not so much in terms of initially functionality, but, you know, the status again. Because as we, as you guys know, the life cycle basically has this Boolean bit, right? I mean, it's more than that because we also have, can retire, archive the projects like Composer and all. But for the most part, all the projects fall into either incubation mode or active status, and there isn't much beyond that. So out of the discussion came up with this idea of, which, you know, again, reminded me of what Hot that uh, brought up or that we discussed uh, uh, some time ago, which was instead of trying to, you know, fold all of these different metrics you might look at into one, you know, name under one label, we could instead empower the users with, uh, you know, more information. And this would be something we can update on a more regular basis where you know, you could start maybe with the exit criteria for incubation, 
and say, okay, instead of trying to say you either, you know, pass because you meet all the criteria or you don't, maybe you can, you know, have a set of metrics similar to those, but you display a level of completion among, uh, you know, against those metrics. So that's the general idea. And maybe there's a way to expose those so that when people go to the, to the website and, you know, in a way similar to what we just talked about with Boro, right? That people can say, oh, what's that project? And on the page, they would have some signal that tell them, well, right now there isn't much activity, you know, then they would know what to expect. And it doesn't mean the projects are not worthy of anything. It just, it just means that. And so that's the general idea. And so um, that's pretty much all I can say as an introduction. I mean, I'm interested to know if, you know, obviously this came up as this, uh, part of the member summit, as I said, but, you know, they have no authority. It's not like they are forcing us to work on this, but I thought it was interesting and we should pick it up and, and or at least look at it, consider it. And so what I'm asking for now is, you know, a bit of reaction similar to what we were talking about earlier. It's like, is that something that's of interest to people that they want to invest in this? Should, you know, does maybe somebody feels like, hey, I'm, I'm interested in putting up a proposal together, at least starting to draft and it doesn't have to be a single person. So, or you feel like, hey, now we've been there, done that. No, I'm not interested in doing more on that. Tracy, go ahead. Yeah, so in the TSC chat, I put a link to something that I had started back when I was a community architect, um, looking at different sorts of maturity aspects for projects. Uh, it didn't go anywhere because uh, I don't think people like the red, yellow, green aspects of it, but um, I do think the ideas in there, even without the colors, are things that we could consider. Um, and I think now that we have the LF analytics um, tool that that might help um, provide some of that. I, I do think that it's, you know, like the LF analytics tool is good, but I don't think it's um, probably what most people would look for as a indication of whether or not they should move forward with a project or not. I think, you know, they need people probably, most people need something that's more easily digestible um, as they look at it. So uh, it, uh, I know that uh, um, David Boswell and I had worked on this and analyzed the ideas. I think that David had in his, um, you know, the, the links he provided in the mailing list were um, probably pulled into this. Um, maybe some other things, I don't know, but uh, it might be a place for us to start if it's easier to start from something and rip it apart. Yeah, thank you for that. And indeed, uh... I wanted to point out David's, uh, David Boswell sent uh, also an email to the list for those who haven't seen it, that is worth to read. Yeah, just to add to that, this is David. If anybody on the TSC is interested in putting the straw man together, I'm more than happy to support. As I said on that post, I've done some maturity work with other communities before and I'm happy to support. Thank you, David. Gary? Oh uh, yeah, so um, I guess I'm trying to figure out, you know, exactly which problem we're sort of trying to solve per se, right? Um, because, you know, just like, just like Apache Software Foundation or whatever, right? I mean, we have some clear rule, we have some clear things about what it takes to become, you know, what we call it an active project, you can call it, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, an accepted project within, within Hyperledger, right? Uh, a set of rules about, you know, code, contribute, you know, stuff, you know, specific things about, you know, Apache licensing, you're giving over all IP, blah, 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 we have to do all those checks. And then, of course, you know, the big one that many people tend to get hit by, right, is, um, you know, community, right? Diversity, right? Um, diversity of maintainers, right? That it's not just managed by like one company or, or, or not, right? And, and again, I think, you know, you look at the original intent of that was to say, so that's, that's, that's what it was all about, right? And th that was supposed to mean that, hey, you know, Hyperledger feels pretty good that 
you know, we've done some diligence in this thing. We don't think there's like one person controlling this whole thing. They can't take it all away and whatever. And that's in the, that's in the, when you read the manifesto or whatever you want to call it, right? That's, 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 that's within there. Um, I think, so, you know, if we want to, if, if there's a, so one suggestion is if somebody wants to say, Hey, there should be a, you, you know, do we want to have along the way a more transparent thing of the status of, a, of, of the status of where somebody is towards meeting those goals? That's one option, right? Um, you know, all, all the rest, right, are kind of like, you know, to me are still, you know, the some somehow we are not educating people on like open source or how to how to look at open source, right? Because to me, right, what's the first thing? I mean, anybody who's going to go, go if, if I want to go use an open source project pro thing, if we want to go use it in Fabric, for example, what's the first things that we do, right? One, we scan to make sure it meets the right licenses generally. If not, somebody catches us that we missed it. Two, we look at when was the last time there was a contribution to this thing? And is it active? Because that either means that it's, you, you, you know, nobody's doing it. It's kind of a dead project. We probably should think twice about doing it, or we have to step up and be ready to fix bugs ourselves if we're willing to take the risk to do that. Right. Those are the types of things that you have to do when you're working in open source. And I, I you know, I, I feel like, you know, half the time this is about open source education. Um, and I still stand by this other thing of people thinking that things are products, not projects. I still think there's that big misconception. Um, and, and, you know, I guess at one point we tied version to active status and whatever, and then we obviously broke that apart, um, which is, which is fine. Right. So to me, somebody's supposed to look at, Hey, do they feel like, you know, we put, you know, so what do we want to say? What does Hyperledger feel that we should say about putting our stamp of approval on a project for people? And if somebody's saying that nobody cares that there's a single maintainer, that there's a single thing on it, then does that mean that we should change the rules of active status to not require uh, diversity, as an example? So I, I know I'm throwing a lot out there, but that's, that's why this kind of, I don't disagree that we should look at this, perhaps, but I don't really know what problem we're actually trying to solve, because I think if people actually were educated in being able to study and look at open source, they would actually know you know, whether or not they should think about considering using a project or not without us calling it active or not. All right. I, I, I take your point on, you know, we should be clear on the problem we want to solve. We want to solve. And, and for that matter, I, I don't personally think we necessarily should tie that discussion to whether we want to keep or not the incubation versus active status maybe there's still value in having that global label. But I think for now, we should really focus on this, you know, notion of matrix that to me, the interest is in, you know, helping, you know, I, I take your point, Gary, that people could figure it out by themselves. But for a lot of people that's, you know, that would take quite a bit of time to figure out, okay, who is really active in this project? What's going on? And so if we could provide some help in figuring this out, I think that would be, you know, a good thing to do. Or, okay, yeah, but we could also provide a quick guide, but I take, I don't think it's actually that hard. Right? And we do you have go the look in, you, go, you, 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 you go look in a GitHub, you go look in a GitHub, or you, go look, you go look in a GitHub repository. It tells you when the last commit for a project was. You hit commit, you can look at that. And it also will tell you how many active contributors you have. I mean, this is, all pretty easy. If somebody wants to just take get stuff and present that in a different form, okay. Right, because otherwise you get into the point of making, you know, decisions for people, right? I, I guess if we think there's best practices for evaluating use of open source code for some less of purposes, right? Then that's then that's then that's uh, then that then that makes sense. Like open source is not commercial quality code, right? So, you know, you have to make your own assessment of this stuff. We're not here, we're not paid by Hyperledger to fix code here, right? I still think people believe that. Well, whether commercial uh, code is of better quality than some of the open source out there is questionable, I would say. It has nothing to, it has nothing to do with that point. Right. You said it's not commercial it, 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 code, it's open source. As no, 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 I said it's not, yeah, it's not, yeah, right. Commercial code 
when you have commercial code, it comes with liabilities that you're willing to stand up to, right? If I build a commercial license, I guarantee you that I'm going to support it. I'm going to support it for this amount of time. We're not going to throw the product away. And if I do anything to violate those agreements, I'm going to give you your money back or you have the right to sue me. Open source doesn't have any of that, right? That, that, that's kind of my point, right? I think sometimes people literally think that these things are like, pro, uh, that, that, I, I guess I still think there's a misconception in a lot of things of people not understanding what these things actually are. And then also then not understanding open source. And, you know, maybe we need some education on open source instead of, so instead of trying to decide, I guess maybe I'll just throw that out there. I think maybe we need to have more details on why we have, you know, current process and, 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 and things you should look at when looking at open source or pointers to people. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there because I've said too much. Um, all right. Thank you. Angelo is on. Yeah, I must admit, I want uh, maybe following a little bit what Gary was saying, I would like to understand what, what, what would mean to have this label of maturity. So it's, uh, I mean, uh, I'm more interested in the implication. Once we give this, start giving these labels, how this label should be perceived, uh, then uh, it's like that we are giving a quality stamp on the project, uh, which I, th I think it's too much to say. Or, I, I, can you argue more a bit more on the, can, can we argue a bit more on, uh, about the implications on this? All right, let's go to Nathan, who is next, but the question is open. So I think we need to be really careful about making it be either community or um, product type management decisions. I think uh, I agree with Gary 100% that we primarily are in charge of facilitating the community and making sure that the project is um, interactive and it's a good place to create innovations. Um, open source communities have to be an interesting place to be or the work grinds to a halt. Um, and if we just make decisions based off of releases and packaged products, we end up neglecting, I think, what, one of the most important parts about participating at Hyperledger. Um, but at the same time, I think we're all interested in writing the best possible code we can write. Um, we just have to be careful that when we put those um, benchmarks or those hoops in place that we're not making artificial barriers and that we're not doing it at the detriment of the participation in the community itself. That the community has to come before the um, product concerns or we, don't, or we won't get a product in the first place. All right, thank you. Brian. Yeah, I, th I think again, the, a comparable to look at here is the core infrastructure initiative badging um, uh, process, you know, the CII badge does not guarantee that your, your, your code has no bugs, has no security defects, is secure in any way. What it guarantees is that there's a process, um, is that there's a, a capability and it is about the people uh, and um, uh, not, not so much the lines of code. So uh, similarly here, I think um, you can e evaluate the, the project you know, no matter what point the code is at, even something that's still a, a version 0 0.1 um, or is version 40.3 and is, you know, pretty stable and not seeing a lot of development, both of those could achieve a high or a low, a low score on this. And, and that would be meaningful data to people considering using it. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? So it's at least triggering quite a bit of discussion so far. So I take it this is worth entertaining a bit more. Um, it's not so clear to me that we have a consensus as to, you know, this is something we should do and that this is well understood by everybody, you know, what is exactly we want to, to achieve. So yeah. it makes it a bit harder to get a proposal going, but. I didn't raise my hand, but um, go ahead, Mark. I, I think some of this came out of the member summit, right? Where it's hard yes. for people to, who aren't as involved as we are to come in and understand, you know, help them select which projects will help them right away or what, what they could be involved in. Um, and, you know, a, a simple Boolean active or um, incubation isn't necessarily helping with the maturity 
of the project from that perspective. And um, we also have a hesitancy to, you know, move people backwards on, on, the, on the list. Um, so, and part of this ties into the marketing and the website. Um, but, you know, we need to have ways to help them make decisions. Um, you know, how, do we promote everything equally on the website or is there a way to indicate which are the healthier projects? Um, and again, you know, this is on the realization that a lot of the people that come in are not going to contribute back. So, you know, we, we have to balance that out. But again, it's, it's all brand related, right? If you come in and you get on a, you know, you want to start using a project that doesn't have as much support as maybe it should, but, um, you know, or it used to, then Hyperledger gets a bad brand in general and it could impact other projects. So, so, so uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, just a, a plug here that I think that this is actually a pretty broad and interesting issue. And um, so the Open Source Security Foundation, which uh, I think some of us uh, are also contributing in, they're going to be the new home for the CII badge. And so feedback from discussions like this is helpful to that community uh, and helpful to bring any, I'm, um, uh, I'm happy to bring any of this discussion over that way. But as, as we evolve this conversation, I think it really is sort of a, a broad thing. Interesting, thanks. Feel free to act as the bridge, at least, you know, some kind of informal liaison. All right, anything else? We're out of time, but uh, I, I do think we need to have a bit more clarity as to whether this is primarily a communication, as it's been, it's been said, right? And, you know, is that a marketing issue primarily? And, you know, again, if you go to the hyperledger.org slash use page, which presents the uh, greenhouse, you know, there is no indication whatsoever as to the status of even the active versus, you know, incubation uh, is not present there. Um, and, you know, is this mostly a problem trying to make this better with adding information so people have uh, additional, you know, th this kind of information at the disposal is really available. Maybe it's at least it's on the page of the the projects themselves, or is there more than that? And it's it has to do with you know more of the management of the projects because you know we are already managing this status, and maybe we want to go beyond that and have this kind of you know we also have quarterly re reports. Quite frankly, I feel like sometimes they may be with not really achieving the goal that they were meant to achieve, which is really to give the TSC uh, more insight as to the status of the, the projects and what's going on. Um, you know, and, and and things like, you know, the fact that Transact, the discussion that happened on the TSC list, you know, with, about the rollover project, we learned through that you know, the transact had a lot of other uses outside of Hyperledger. It was completely news to me. And I'm like, why didn't that? Yeah, I never got that out of the reports. And so there are the things like this that maybe the reports, we need to work more on the reports. I don't know. So I think there's definitely something more to dig in there. So I think for now, we'll leave it at this. Um, some of it, you know, might be a communication issue. Some may be more. And it has more with the to do with the way we manage a project and surface their status. So with that being said, I think I'm gonna close the call on that. I want to thank you all for joining, participating to this discussion. The discussion will be carried on forward.